Right. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Hook and Cook webinar part three. Today's topic is Cooking 101. Now, just as a reminder, this is being recorded and broadcast on YouTube Live. So just as a quick reminder there. So as I said, this is part three of our series. And if you missed the first two parts, don't worry. Those are all on the department's YouTube page. You can go back and watch those whenever you want, as many times as you want. Um, so today's topic, Cooking 101, we're going to go to Chase Wallen here in just a moment, who is our info center supervisor here at the department. He'll be going over different filleting and cleaning styles of panfish. And then we'll go visit with Miss Martha Yunt from UK to show us some basic cooking stuff. And she'll be highlighting some cook wild recipes, which is a really awesome program that they've got there. We've been working with them. So let's go on and hand it over to Chase and he can get started. Good. Hey everybody, so we're going to go over how to fillet a panfish. Now, as you may know, there are many different types of species of panfish, but in terms of filleting, it's generally going to be pretty well the same. Um, today we've got a couple uh, bluegill and we have a, a red ear sunfish. Um, very similar in body size, body structure, crappie is going to be almost the same way. Um, but Starting off with basics, um, always wear rubber gloves to protect yourself. I like to use a sterilized cutting board, uh, obviously large enough to work on the surface. And then, of course, the most important part, your fillet knife. Now, there's many different types of fillet knives. I've got two here. Um, Rapala makes a really good fillet knife that's, that's just the right size for these guys. Um, this is my old trusty Rusty. I've used this one since I was a kid. Uh, Bubba Blade also makes a really nice fillet knife. Um, all of them are high carbon steel. Now there is a difference between a good fillet knife and a bad fillet knife. If you're going to Walmart and paying five bucks for it, you're gonna get what you're paying for. Um, so invest a little bit more money, invest a little bit of research, get a high carbon blade, a uh, high carbon stainless steel blade, and it'll pay off for you in the long run. Now the key with any fillet knife is flexibility. With these fish, you've got a very tiny bone structure and you're gonna to have to be able to get in and get around that, especially whenever you're going to flay the skin off, you want flexibility in your knife and I'll demonstrate some of that in just a minute. Um, and of course, sharpness, sharpness is key. If you're kind of uncomfortable in sharpening enough, um, I know it can be an intimidating process getting out of whetstone and going at it, not knowing your angles and all that, there are commercial sharpeners available. Uh, Work Sharp, for example, uh, makes a good commercial sharpener and you can get these now to razor sharp in seconds with stuff like that. So let's get down to business. Um, before I fillet anything, what I like to do is take and pat dry the fish. Fish have a natural slime coat that whenever you place the fish on ice, or if you run it in some water to try to clean it up, something like that, it's going to make it progressively worse in terms of being slippery and hard to handle. Um, so you can take a couple of paper towels, just blot it dry, get that slime coat off, and it's gonna be much, much easier to handle. So starting out, what we're gonna do, and it doesn't matter which side you start on, but take the fish, you're gonna move the pectoral fin, and now you're gonna kind of use this gill plate right here as a guide. What I'm gonna do is make one incision from here all the way up to the top of the spine, kind of in a curved angle, just like that. Now you don't wanna cut super deep, more or less, what I'm doing here is breaking the skin, just like that. If you cut too deep down here, you're gonna get into the gut pocket. And if you cut too deep up here, you're gonna sever the spinal cord and it's gonna to start to bleed. So shallow incision all the way around the fish. Now, as you can see, I've got some scales on my knife. It's really important to keep that off. 
if you have a scale on your knife, when you go in to start to flay, it's not only going to hold you off, but I have actually slipped because of those and injured myself. So make sure your knife is clean. Now, what we're going to do is go in with the very tip of the knife, and we're going to make a small incision, starting down this spine, following that, that fin. And what I'm going to do is progressively go a little bit deeper until I start to hit the rib cage. Now I'm hitting the ribs right there, and my knife can't go any deeper. I'm going to follow that rib cage all the way down the spine of the fish until I get past it. At this point, my knife can go all the way through the fish, just like that. I'm gonna hold my knife down at a slight angle, not hardly 45 degrees, but just against the body of the fish. That way I know I'm not gonna miss any meat. And I'm gonna work that knife blade all the way down to the tail. Now, I do not finish cutting this off. Some people do, but what I like to do is leave this on go over, process the other side, because it makes it a little bit easier to handle and a little bit easier to cut on. If I was to remove this fillet right now, I'm gonna have a bunch of space and some weird angles for this fish to lay. But if I leave that on, that fish is just perfectly flat, just like the other side. So I'm gonna go in just like on the other one. Make my shallow incision. Clean my scales off. Go in, touching the rib cage, walking it down past the ribs, go all the way through the fish, hold it at an angle, walk it down to the base of the tail. Clean my scales off. Now we can go ahead and take these fleas off. A couple different ways you can do this. Some people like to take and cut straight through this rib cage and take the whole fillet off. I don't prefer that because I get into the gut pocket. For me, this is how I learned to fillet. I take and spread the fish apart. I take my knife, kind of hold it like a pencil. Sorry. Go in, just like that. I can control the tip that way. And that's all we're gonna use is the tip of this knife. I go in and you do something called tickling the ribs. What I'm doing, I'm walking that fillet right up and over the top of that rib cage. Be mindful of your hands. Be mindful of the tip of the knife. Walk it all the way down until we get it off the ribs. Now I'm gonna take the belly of my knife sever that skin down to my original cut. At this point, that fillet is ready to get the skin off. Clean my scales off. Now, this is probably one of the more intimidating parts of flaying is getting the skin off of the fillet. If you mess it up, don't worry about it. You can always go back in and start another cut and continue down until you get the, the fillet off the skin. But what you wanna do is make a very, very shallow cut Horizontal cut, just like that. Now, I did not cut all the way through that fillet. I did not cut through the skin. I'm going to put my knife into that cut, and I'm going to mash it flat, just like this. Now, it's against the tail, so it's holding it up a little bit. But whenever I get down here on the cutting board, my knife is going to be like this, just flat as flat can get. Now, as long as I keep that flat, and I just move the knife almost in a little sawing motion with a little bit of pressure, it's gonna walk that flay right off that skin. If at any time I turn that knife like that or up, it's gonna come out of the flay. I'm either gonna miss meat turning it up or I'm gonna cut through the skin and have to start over if I turn it down. So that's where the bend comes in handy, keeping it flat. So go down, I use my thumb to hold the, the fish, get to where you all can see, and then I'm just gonna walk Little bitty sawing motion, right like that. And there's your fillet. No guts, no mess, no bones, no skin. So go back to the other side. We've already made our cuts. I'm gonna open it up, go in, tickle those ribs, go right up, over and around them. 
go down, sever that skin, meet that fillet up. Shallow incision, hold my knife flat, let the knife do the work. Walk that fillet right off, just like that. And now that method is going to be useful for any type of pan fish. Um, once I got the fillets cleaned and off the fish, what I like to do is put them into a bowl of ice cold water immediately. Um, the fish flesh starts to degrade fairly quickly, especially if it's in a warmer temperature. So if you get it in water, you get it in ice cold water, that's going to help preserve it while you flay the rest of your fish out. There are a couple other methods that you can use for flaying fish. Um, if you're not 100% comfortable doing the skin method, um, actually how I first flayed fish when I was a kid was to take the back of my knife, I would take a pair of pliers or something to hold this tail, and you take your knife and you can actually flake all of these scales off this fish. Now you don't want to use the belly of your knife, obviously, because you're going to dull it and you're going to possibly cut into the flesh, but use the back of your knife. I've used a spoon, I've used a butter knife. Um, I've used a super dull knife, but just something to get all of these scales off. And the, the uh, skin on these are actually, it's kind of an interesting texture thing and, and it actually adds a little bit of flavor in my opinion when you go to cook it. But once you've got that whole fish scaled, you follow the same steps and you cut that meat off and then that filet is ready to go. I think it's got it. Okay. I do have a few questions for Chase that I think are common questions I get at some of the classes I teach. Um, an electric filet knife works just as well as your standard knife. Do you prefer one over the other? I actually prefer a standard knife. Um, electric flea knife works just fine. Absolutely just fine. To me, I like complete and total control. I like to feel where my cut's going, how deep in I'm going, all that stuff. I like to feel the ribs. I like to feel the bones. I think that an electric flea knife will take that away from you just a little bit. So my recommendation to a beginner, if you're not super comfortable flaying fish, is to start with a standard knife. Um, that knife, when you hold it and you do everything super gently and when it's razor sharp, is going to tell you everything about the bone structure, about the structure of the fish. Um, and I think that you'll learn a little bit better by using that versus electric flea knife, but by no means is one better than the other. Awesome. Um, my next thought too is you're just wearing standard gloves, but some people like to wear the Kevlar gloves for cut protection, which is something right. I suggest to a new person as well. Do you just not like those for the feel or just you feel confident enough you're not going to cut your finger off? What? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I've cut myself more times than not. Um, Kevlar gloves are a great option. Uh, to me, I, I've, I've suffered a couple accidents, uh, unfortunately, in the past, and I don't have feeling into my fingers on my hand. So for me, the added bulk is going to make it difficult for me to hold the fish and get it up and maneuver it and things like that. And whenever I'm cutting, my mind is solely on this knife and where this knife edge is at all times. So I'm well aware of where my hand's at. I mean, accidents do and can happen. Remember I told you about the scales getting under your knife. But, uh, but yeah, that's a great uh, option to invest in, especially if you're new around knives, if you're not super comfortable with knives, uh, definitely get the Kevlar below for your off hand. Awesome, thank you, Chase. Um, if we have more questions for Chase later, we can get those answered. But right now, let's go join Martha Yunt, who is a nutrition education specialist with the University of Kentucky Cooperative Extension. I hope I said her title right. It was a mouthful for me there. Um, she's out in the field, actually, so this will be interesting. Martha, whenever you're ready, take it away. Oh, I think you're muted there, Martha. How about that, Andrew? There we go. Is that better? All right. Take her away. Okay. Well, when uh, when Fish and Wildlife contacted me about doing the cooking part, I thought, well, I looked at my calendar and we'd planned to uh, take some time off and go camping. 
then we decided that might be a fun thing to do is to actually do it in the field. So I'm in a public campground and um, sorry about the background noise and who knows what may happen. And uh, we're going to do the best we can. And this is our supper. So it's got to turn out or else we won't have anything to eat. So um, like Andrew said, I work with University of Kentucky Nutrition Education Program. And one of our new projects that is in partnership with Fish and Wildlife is Cook Wild Kentucky. So after we get this recipe cooking, I'm going to come back and Andrew is going to help out with uh, some other things to show you. And we'll talk some more while it's cooking. So let's go ahead and get, get the recipe going. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show you how we're going to cook it tonight because uh, Easton thought it might be a fun way to show you a different way of, of outdoor cooking. So the recipe we're doing tonight is oven fried uh, fish fillets. And my husband's going to help me out with the uh, cameraman, but he can't see it. So, all right, let's. OK, there we go. That's good. So I have fish fillets here, of course. Mine came from the store, Chase. Um, I don't have the skills that you have. So this recipe calls for a pound of fish, and this is a little less than that, but there are just two of us eating tonight. So we've got our fish fillets here. And then, um, and I think maybe if Jim will just hold the camera still, I'll try to move the thing so you can see it. And this is a very simple recipe and a fun way to do it. I know fried fish is fabulous. But um, sometimes you might want to try something new and do a little bit rest, uh, a little bit healthier recipe. So in this container, I have two tablespoons of vegetable oil and two tablespoons of lemon juice. And I'm just going to pour it on that and coat the pieces of fish. And anything uh, extra with that, just make sure that you get that mixture on both sides. And I'm going to put it in my pan. And so these, these fillets just came from the grocery store and this is cod, but this recipe works well with those pan fish that Chase was showing you. It works well with any mild fish. All right, let me turn this last one over and get it coated on both sides. Put that in our pan. And then our seasoning mixture is a fourth of a cup of shredded Parmesan cheese, a fourth of a cup uh, I mean, a fourth of a teaspoon of dill weed, fourth of a teaspoon of salt, and fourth of a teaspoon of pepper. And I'm just going to sprinkle that right on top of the fish. We're not going to try to coat anything on the bottom. And I, I could save a little bit of this since um, we would have one more piece of fish, but I'm going to go ahead and put it all on there to add a little extra flavor. And with fried fish, you know, we have that crunch. Well, we won't get that with a baked fish. And so this is two cups of cornflake cereal. And I'm just gonna crunch it up and put a coating right on top of our seasoning mix. Again, we won't try to get any on the, on the bottom. It would just make it soggy anyway. We're just gonna put this right on the top. Okay. And then that is, that's ready to go. Let me get my hands clean before we move on to how we're going to cook it. So after we get this one going, um, Andrew's going to show you how we would cook it in a Dutch oven, which is what most people would probably think about doing. But what we're going to do tonight, and Jimmy may need to back up just a bit. Okay, that's perfect right there. We're going to actually bake this in a cardboard box. This is a reflector oven. So this is a 40 pound banana box that I've lined with aluminum foil. And you can see it's a fancy one. It has a turkey roasting bag to make a window over the top. And uh, Jim's going to follow me. We're going to go over to where the charcoal is, is going and we'll get this ready to cook. Okay. And again, just bear with us. Um, we'll do the best we can about making sure you can see and hear. So, yeah, Jim can't tell. You're doing great. Don't tilt it down yet. So this box is actually going to go on top. Tilt down just a little bit, Jim. Okay, that's perfect. So I have a sheet of aluminum foil here on the ground. And I'm going to put some hot coals. right on our aluminum foil. Now 
Now, usually, just a second, then I'll, okay. So usually to make a 400 or a 375 degree oven, we need 15 pieces of hot charcoal. I just wrote it on the box so I remember. And I'm gonna line those up evenly on the floor. And this is a baking rack. I put a little extra charcoal on there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Maybe I'll put a couple more in. We had a little trouble with our biscuits yesterday. You're, you're still good, Jim. And they, they just didn't get hot enough. And now I'm going to cover that up with the box. Okay, and Jim will go back to the table. All right, so let me tell you a little bit more about that reflector oven. So since you have aluminum foil on all four sides, that's going to take the heat from the charcoal. It really doesn't take a lot of charcoal. If you were going to do bake a cake 350 degrees, I'm gonna let Jim help with one more thing. I have some cheesy onion cornbread to go in. I'm just gonna let him put that in the oven next to the fish. Thank you. <laughs> he thought he was going to get to do something fun. Because, of course, we'll miss those hush puppies that you usually have with fried fish. And so uh, this is just a quick cornbread recipe that has some onion and some cheddar cheese in it. So we'll have a side dish with our fish, even though it's not hush puppies. And then a little bit later, I'm going to put this is some asparagus spears that are in um, aluminum foil. We'll put that on the fire, too. So we'll have a nice meal. So with a reflector oven, it's just sort of a fun way to do it. It means you don't have to buy anything except aluminum foil and um, a, turkey a turkey roasting bag to put over that opening on the top. And it is a fun thing to do. But traditionally, you would use a Dutch oven to make this recipe outside. And so um, I'm going to set my timer so that I don't forget to check that. Andrew, if you want to go ahead. We've got a short video from an, another day, an earlier day, where I did this same recipe in a cast iron Dutch oven. So we've trimmed that down to a little over three minutes. And Andrew, if you want to go ahead and play that, we'll see how to cook this recipe in a Dutch oven. Okay, just a second and I'll share it here. Okay. I'm working on it, everybody. I didn't forget, I promise. Technology's getting me. <laughs> Andrew, I see it, but I don't hear any sound. Okay, let me try this. About there, is, there is sound, but it's sort of quiet. Well, I've got it turned all the way up. That's all we got, unfortunately. <laughs> Andrew, I don't think we're going to be able to hear that. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, Martha. I thought I had it figured out. Martha, do you know the video well enough that you can... Uh, I can narrate. narrate. I, I sure can. So go ahead and let it just turn the uh, turn the sound off. Okay. Gotcha. Because basically it's going to be exactly the same thing um, that we just did and put in the box. There you go. 
Okay. All right. So there you see, I've got, again, fish fillets from the store. Um, and that's that same mixture. In fact, I, I tried to use <clears throat> the same containers too. So that's the lemon juice and the oil. And, and there I just put it right down into the bag instead of um, putting it out in a pan. And my Dutch oven, see, I had lined with aluminum foil. And um, a, um, and if, you know, we can, we can, we can just do this without it going if we need to. There we go. Okay. So I lined the Dutch oven with aluminum foil. If there's a strong flavor or if I'm doing something that's sticky like a blackberry cobbler, just to keep those flavors from soaking down into the cast iron pan. And um, we're putting, getting ready to put the seasoning mix. And if it'll skip forward enough, or maybe it'll get there. So that's that same seasoning mix that's going on top of the fish fillets. And it is, it is moving. I think we'll be all right. We'll let it go. And, and I really want you to see how we put the charcoal on it. So if you've already done some Dutch oven cooking, um, you know the way that it makes an oven is that we're going to get coals on the bottom and the top. There's the corn flakes, just crushing up plain corn flakes to sprinkle on the top. And no, I'm I'm not going to tell you that this tastes just as good as fried fish because really you can't beat fried fish and hush puppies. But I have high blood pressure, and people in my family need to watch the. Um, other things in, in their diet so that we can be a little bit healthier and enjoy fishing and camping a little bit longer. And so the Cook Wild Kentucky recipes are healthier versions. So there goes the corn flakes onto it. And if, if our timing's off, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll manage it. And I'm putting the lid on the Dutch oven. You see a camp oven has short little stubby legs and then it has a rim on the top so that we can put charcoal on it. And so for that one, that's an 18, um, oh, well that, that cooked really fast. That 20, 20 minutes was up. And then we put the lid back on to let it cook a little bit longer. It took about 30 minutes altogether on that. And we're almost to the end of the video. And so we'll see how it looks when it's done. And there is the, the baked fish. Okay, Andrew, thank you. All right, so a little bit more about Dutch oven cooking and then um, Andrew is going to show us how you can find all the cook wild recipes. So with, with cast iron Dutch oven cooking, if you, never, if you have never done that, let me get that set up. Okay, cast iron is great and it is so versatile and it's very fuel efficient. It doesn't take a lot of heat to cook in, um, in cast iron. A camp oven has those little short legs on the bottom and it has a rim around the lid so that you can put coals, either charcoal like I'm using in that video or coals from your wood fire. And you put some on the bottom and some on the top. And it, it takes less on the bottom because all of the heat is going up into the pan. And then the coals that are on the top, you know, we're losing part of that heat up. And so we would put more coals on top. And so I think what I used, what I used just as a, a starting point with my 12 inch cast iron Dutch oven, if I'm aiming for a 400 degree oven, then I'll use about 10, there's a, a honeybee or a yellow jacket. I'll use about 10 coals in a circle on the bottom. Now, if you're frying or stewing or roasting, then it doesn't matter if you have coals in the middle, but if you're baking and you put coals in the middle, you'll burn every time. And, and uh, trust me, years of experience, you will burn every time on baking if you put coals in the middle. So you make a circle of the coals, the same diameter of your pan, put your pan over it. And then on top though, you make an even, uh, even layer of coals so that there's even heat all, all over the top. You can bake anything outside that you can inside. You can cook anything outside that you can inside. And so really it does make camping out more fun, I think, when you can uh, when you can enjoy some of the cooking too. Well, Andrew, let's see if we can get the, um... oh, that's great. Where'd you find that, Andrew? Wonderful. Sorry, now, Martha, for... it's Brent, I just Googled yeah. it. I was like, Brent did that, I wish I was that good. <laughs> Okay. Well, now you look at that picture just for a minute. 
And you see there is one piece of charcoal in the middle of the bottom. For baking, you would not put one there, but you would if you were roasting or stewing or frying, you would put that one in the middle. But for baking, you don't put one in, in the middle. It just gets too much heat in the middle. All right, well, thank you, Brent, great. Okay, well, now we'll go to, and if you wanna go to the Plan, Eat, Move website, and um, I'm on my phone. I can't put that in, in the chat, but it's just www.planeatmove.com. And there's a lot of neat things there. But, Andrew, if you'll click on recipes across that top bar. It's right over here for everybody. Recipes. And when you have time, there's information about Oops. gardening, meal planning, lots of other things. But for today, we're just going to look at recipes. And there on Browse by Category, um, if you see that bar over on the left, we can scroll all the way down. Well, not quite all the way down, but there's Cook's Wild Kentucky. And so this project is a partnership with Fish and Wildlife and with um, Feeding Kentucky and with um, Hunters for the Hungry. And so the, the project started because food pantries were receiving some ground venison and some other game meat but the people didn't. The people who got that food, who received it, didn't know how how to cook it, or they weren't familiar with it. And so it started out. I think now we have 22 recipes, and we're getting started on the next round. We will have a lot of venison and fish because that's most common. But as Andrew's scrolling down there, you'll see there's turtle, there is wild turkey, there are frog legs, and uh, right now on my screen, I can see the oven fried fish fillet. So if you wanted to find this recipe we're doing today, you would click on that and you would get it. Um, but it has been such a great project working on these and finding recipes that fit within the dietary guidelines for Americans. So all of these recipes are very limited in sodium. They're limited in saturated fats. They're limited in total calories and they're simple to prepare. So we're just getting started on the next round so be watching for those. And the ones that I'm gonna to get to experiment with and, and do some tasting trials with are a burgoo with several different wild games in there. Oh, I see that catch of the day burger on my screen right now. That is fabulous. So you can serve that on a bun um, like, a, like a fish sandwich, but it starts out with any kind of, of mild white fish. So if you have some, maybe the fillets, maybe as you're learning how to fillet and and you don't don't make those perfect fillets yet, you can use uh, large and small pieces of fish. You actually cook it in water, boil it till the fish is done, and then you can shred it up, mix it with eggs and Parmesan cheese and some uh, breadcrumbs and make those patties. And that one is really good too. And you just quickly cook it in the, in the skillet. We have, we're going to be doing a sausage and beaver gumbo and a baked raccoon with our next round. And um, now a friend sent me this one as a joke today, but you might push us a little far and we'll see what we can do. So there was an article about these cicadas, 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 however you want to say it, that are, uh, that are coming out this year. And are they edible and how can you cook them? Now, I did not volunteer to do a trial on that recipe. But if any of you are really interested, then we, we might go ahead. Andrew, what do you think? Are you interested in cicadas? I mean, I'll try it. <laughs> All the other ones have been delicious, I will say. I'm always a little hesitant when I hear healthy recipes, but these were actually all really good and I would make any of these, so. Yeah, and, and that that is the challenging thing because you really can't beat a fried piece of fried fish. Uh, but if we eat that, too often, then our bodies might uh, start complaining at us. And we want to be healthy for a long time and be able to enjoy these outdoor activities. Were there any, uh, any questions about outdoor cooking in general? Uh, it does look like Brent has put the Plan Eat Move website in the chat. So if anybody's looking for that. Um, Great, thank you. Uh oh, there he goes. What has Brent found now? Oh, there's the cicadas. Okay. <laughs> oh, dear. I don't know about that. Now, when we were visiting my husband's family in Japan a few years ago, um, we did eat some stir-fried grasshoppers that 
were a, a local de delicacy. They, um, they're these huge grasshoppers that grow in the rice fields. And after harvest time, they would, I would think that would be a lot like um, crawfish for us, you know, that uh, other people would look at that and say, how in the world would you want to eat that, uh, that you dig out of the mud in the bottom of the creek? Uh, but these grasshoppers, so you did take off the, the hind legs, the spiny, the hard hind legs, and they, they stir fried them real quick in some soy sauce, and uh, they were crispy, tasted like soy sauce. So so I won't say that I'll never eat a cicada, but, but we'll see about that. It would be an interesting dish. Um, I don't know, but I still have this uh, PowerPoint if you'd like to go over that too, Martha. Are you interested in that or? Oh, yeah, I forgot it? all about that. Yeah. Okay, and, and we do have a timer set for, okay. um, I'm expecting the fish to take about 30 minutes to cook. And so uh, we set a timer for 20 minutes. So we'll go over and check it then. But yes, let's, I'm sorry, Andrew, I forgot all about that PowerPoint. Let's we You're good. skip, run through that. There we go. Okay, so Chris says, what is the strangest animal that you've ever eaten? Well, turtle's not really strange, but that one, um, I ha maybe the raccoon was the strangest, and I really was very hesitant about that one. And my brother-in-law that lives in Louisiana is actually the one that uh, shared cooking tips on that. And first trial of that recipe was very bland. It was just raccoon and sweet potatoes. But we'll be adding some more savory vegetables um, like onions and some celery in that next go round. The turtle, I know that I hear people who who hunt for turtles and eat turtles often, that the different parts of the turtle taste like different kinds of, of meat. And so the recipe we did for Cook Wild Kentucky was for the legs. And I think that is not a very common, it's, it's, um, it's not tender like that back strap that um, I've heard people say that, that the back strap tastes more like, um, like lobster if you cook it right. And the legs are a little more tough. So I ended up cooking those overnight in the crock pot and then they got really, really tender. And then we put them in the packet with, I think it was uh, some potatoes and onion. You could do those and then in the oven or on the campfire. And I only see the chat box when it flashes up for a minute. So Andrew, if you see other things, go ahead and, um, and point them out to me. All right. So this was the oven fried fish fillet. We'll skip on to the next one and this way you can get the recipe. I sort of skipped through it quickly, but you'll be able to see it. So we can go on to the next slide. And there's the, we do have a professional photographer from, um, okay, I see Stuart's question. When I cook fish in the oven, it gets wet and mushy. Or I don't know if you're overcooking it. Fish only needs to cook to 145 degrees or when it is solid white and flakes. So um, I don't know if you might be overcooking it. Is it fish you've caught yourself, Stuart? And has it been frozen? I mean, that, that, that really shouldn't, shouldn't matter. I'm just trying to, to think of the different variables that might affect it. That was my thought is maybe it wasn't completely thawed. I've had that happen. And then I come to find out that my fish wasn't all the way thawed out when I went to cook it. Yes, I had a bad experience um, with, with that. So it does need to be completely thawed and you don't want to hurry it up thawing. Like, you know, with other meats, we can hurry them up a little bit for thawing, but with fish, you don't, you want to let it have that time to thaw. The oven needs to be hot when you put it in um, so that it will cook at that temperature. He says uh, it was from the store and it was frozen. Uh, so, uh, Stuart, if you would like to unmute yourself, you're, you feel free uh, hey, hey. to finish your question there. Maybe. Okay, well, if he wants to, or if you want to keep putting in the chat box, that's fine too. We can, we can see that. All right, let's go on to the next slide. It was his wife and he's hitting me, but um, no, sometimes when we cook fish in the oven, we often, it's, it's like we put it in there and then it, liquid comes out. And maybe it's like you said, we didn't have it completely thawed, even though we had taken it out and thawed it and we patted it dry paper towels. And, and I, I don't know the answer on, on that. Hotter, um, a hotter heat, you don't want to cook it. You don't want to cook fish low and slow like we do so much other wild game. Okay. We really want to get that okay. to the right temperature uh, quickly. 
So here's the written okay. recipe. I, I told you what it was. Um, so we've got the one pound of fish, two tablespoons lemon juice, two tablespoons vegetable oil. Now I use shredded cheese today, but the last time I made this at home, I didn't have shredded cheese and I used um, grated Parmesan and it did okay too. And the dill weed is, is really nice on this. It gives that some flavor and salt. And it does have salt and pepper, but it doesn't have as much salt as you would usually put in. Now, pepper, lay it to it because they haven't found anything uh, where pepper hurts your hurts your body. And then the cornflake type cereal. Okay, let's go on to the next, the next slide. And that is, that's the directions on how you would do it in a Dutch oven. So that 12 to 14 hot pieces of charcoal. And there's always a range because if it's a windy day, it's going to take more. And if it's a searing hot day, it's probably going to take a few less. Wind really blows the heat away. And then that 20 to 22 um, on top, and that's going to get it close to 400 degree oven. Now, I think that the, the regular baking directions on this recipe are for a little bit lower. But since we didn't want that fish to stew, and maybe that's what's happening. Um, okay, thawing frozen fish in hot water. And I know we get in a hurry on a lot of things, but maybe the, the best plan. But if you're cooking that fish, if it's still frozen a little bit and that liquid comes out and it's a lower temperature and it's going to end up sort of stewing it, that might affect your texture too. Uh, and I'll check with some people that know more than me about this. And uh, if I find an answer for that, I'll get it back to Andrew and he can get that to you. Okay, let's, let's go on to the, the next slide. And that's just the, the picture of the ingredients for the seasoning. Okay, we can go on. And there, the nutrition facts are on, we don't have to go over, over these, but all of the Cook Wild Kentucky recipes have the nutrition facts on there. And it's sort of hard to find those for wild game. It's pretty easy to find nutrition facts on other foods. Um, so we are able, the nutrition database that we use to analyze the recipes does have wild game in there and we're able to put that in there. Uh, Jim, how many more minutes are we, do we have before we check? Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So that, uh, the, that is cake coming out of the, the box reflector oven. So the inside of the oven is lined with aluminum foil, and then you use, just use duct tape around the edge to hold it. And I can't, don't know if you can tell from the picture, but the hand holes are, are punched out in the foil so that we get some air circulation in it. We want to make sure that the charcoal does not touch the box um, because it, it, would, it would set it on fire. Um, do, you reuse want... your, uh, do you reuse your box, Martha? I, I do. And I have been using this same box, I would say, for the last 15 years. And I, I reline it maybe every three or four years when, when the foil starts getting torn. Um, I try to be careful with it, but, but I carry my stuff in it too. So I just make sure that I'm careful as I'm putting things inside the box to carry that I'm not uh, punching holes in the aluminum foil or in that plastic turkey roasting bag that's on the bottom. But yes, you can, you can use it over and over again. And in that picture, I was using bricks covered with foil. Sometimes I have used cans like empty vegetable cans. Or if you're, if you're really in a pinch, you can use empty soda cans. Uh, they're not as stable. So I wouldn't recommend the empty soda cans. And I wrapped the bricks in foil to keep them from absorbing the heat. I wanted all the heat to come out and bounce around so we cook, cook on the top and all sides. So uh, it doesn't take a lot of charcoal in there to get that oven going. Okay, in 20 seconds, oh, this is perfect timing. We're gonna go over and, um, and see how that's coming along. And we'll find out, do we need to put some more coals in or is it, is it cooking sort of on track? So Andrew, if you don't mind stopping sharing right now and we're, we're gonna go over to the fire and see how it's doing. Okay, if you want to get that. So you can, and I want to cover it up quick. 
All right, we'll go back to the table. It seems like it's going right on track. And Jim said it smells good, so. So you could see that the cornbread was starting to bake, but it's not brown yet. And the fish is, um, the fish is cooking, but it, it hasn't browned yet, but it's starting to turn um, opaque white, which is what we want. And uh, I'll hunt through, I'll hunt through my cook box here and see if I remembered my thermometer because that is the best way to check. But with fish, you can just, if it'll flake with a fork and it's solid white. So Jim, if it's 10 more minutes, please. Okay, and Andrew, we'll go back and finish up the, Actually, we're just filling in some time now um, until we get that finished. Okay, and there is the, um, the cover page of the Plan, Eat, Move website. And, and thank you, Andrew, already for showing us how that works. And these are just pictures of some other fish recipes that we have already. So there is a, a baked fish with, I think that one had a dill sauce. This one is catfish fillets. It has mushrooms and ground ginger and some soy sauce. That one has a, a, a different flavor. I really like that. And uh, see if we have another one. Oh, I already told you about the catch of the day burgers, but I really, I really like those. And they have, um, they have a, a nice taste. You can serve them on a bun with some lettuce and tomato and a little bit of mayonnaise. And that makes a, a great meal. And What's coming up next for Cook Wild Kentucky is trout. So we will have um, several, hopefully several trout recipes. And Becky Wallen contacted me and let me know that she has, she has a source for our trout to do the recipe testing. And then we'll also, uh, in this next round of recipes, venison, elk, beaver, squirrel, rabbit, turkey, and raccoon. And I know the the turkey recipe we're going to work with is for turkey legs. A lot of times the turkey breast is the favored, um, the favored cut, but um, this one, what we're hoping will turn out is a slow cooker barbecued uh, wild turkey legs on that. And that may, we're close to the end here, Andrew, let's go on. And then now if there are any, um, any questions? And I would love to hear some of the strange, um, the strange wild game meats that you all have tasted or tried or cooked. I will say I've always been curious about groundhog. I don't know if anybody's tried groundhog before. It's kind of one of those weird things. I eat all this other wild game, so what's a groundhog? You know. <laughs> that that is on the list, Andrew. Maybe not for twenty two. Oh yes, Chris, go ahead. I have heard people say that you can cook turkey legs in like a pressure cooker or something and it makes them tender. Do you know any other way to do that? Because there, well, I think it was like two years ago, we put a whole bird on the smoker and the legs came out tough. And then we heard of the pressure cooker. What's another way? The slow cooker, and that's why that's exactly why we're going to test that recipe in the slow cooker. Of course, it's going to take multiple hours, whereas the pressure cooker would do it a lot faster. Uh, okay. Not everybody has a pressure cooker, and a lot of people are afraid of a, a pressure cooker. So since our, our funding comes from my work, from a federal grant, and we have to make sure that the equipment we use is easily available. And so we felt like a slow cooker was easily available and you can find those at the dollar store for less than $20, but a pressure cooker is a, is a little bigger investment. Okay. I have so one we more might not question. Be able to okay. Oh yeah, go ahead. Y'all do all these tests with the different types of meat, like elk and venison and turkey and stuff. Where do y'all hunt for all that? Well, our main source is Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. So, Andrew, you take that one. Yes. So, a lot of this meat is donated to them by sportsmen who have harvested it legally, and so they'll donate the meat to us, and then we'll get it to UK for them to do the taste tests on. And then a lot of these things you can buy commercially, like rabbit, turkey, those kind of things. So, that's where I'm shooting you guys get some of it from. I know I went out and hunted some doves and donated those for them to test their dove recipes on. But How's dove taste? Oh, that was really good. Very, very tender. Wrap it in some bacon with a jalapeno on it. It's good. 
Now, I, I didn't hear you say that, Andrew, because there's no way we can get bacon to fit in the <laughs> nutrition guidelines, no. but it sounds like that would be fabulous. <laughs> Okay, any other questions, comments, please un unmute and jump in. We've got to we've got to fill in a little more time till that gets through so, bacon. I do have some fish related thoughts. Um, so what do you suggest is proper storage of fish long term, Martha? And again, Andrew, I will look up the official answer and let you know, but we know that fresh fish refrigerated doesn't um Chris, yes, give me just a minute to answer this and then she's certainly welcome to. So fresh fish, like Chase told us when he was filleting that, it does start to break down fast. And so you wouldn't want to keep in the refrigerator. Now th this is just an educated guess right now for more than one or two days. And it'd probably be best if it was frozen in less than 24 hours after, after it was caught. But again, I'll find the answer for that. And I'll let Andrew know so that he can get back. But it does break down really fast. So with freezing, there are different different techniques for that. Some people like to freeze the fillets in a block of ice, so in, in water and freeze it. Then you've really got to be patient on that thawing because it's going to take a long time for that to thaw with, the, with that big block of ice. Okay, go ahead and let's have that other question. So if you are going to cook like raccoon, how do you cook that? Okay, well, how old, how old are you? Seven, almost okay. eight. All right. Well, you may have watched your um, folks in your family cook other meats. And so, um, and you're probably in the grocery store with them too. So, you know, when you look there in the meat case, where the chicken is and the hamburger and those kind of things. Well, that is raw meat. And so the, um, the raccoon meat would, I think that raccoon meat is a little bit like turkey thighs. If you were gonna compare it to a, a meat you might see in the grocery store. So it is, um, it's not really a dark meat, but it's not like chicken breast meat that's really white. And so it is more like a, a turkey thigh or chicken thigh and so it's really important that game meats are harvested right and and the meat is prepared the right way and so I count on people who know how to do that like Chase doing the fish and I don't know who Andrew would recommend but there are so many great classes from Fish and Wildlife that can teach you that part. So once it looks like meat and it's in a Ziploc bag and handed to me, then that's when I'm ready to cook it. And I, I would cook wild game meat the same way that I would that chicken from the grocery store or um, a beef roast. That is a great question. Was there, was there more? Okay. Well, okay. Well, the way the recipe that we've been working on with that, it is roasted in the oven. So that means that the raw meat is uh, cut into the right pieces. And I did cut it off, off the bone, I think, for that recipe. And then I put it in a pan, we cut up onions, well, sweet potatoes before, but this time it will have the sweet potatoes and onions and some celery. And I'll bake that in the oven so that the vegetables and the meat will cook at the same time. All right. Andrew, did you want to put anything in uh, about your other classes? Oh, well, yeah, sure. We do host a hook and cook class, which this webinar is named after, where we teach you all the basics of fishing. So fishing 101, all the way through the filleting portion like Chase did, we'll teach you that. And we'll actually get a fish in front of you to practice on. And then usually we cook something to show you, but with all these new restrictions, we're still kind of holding off on that. But now we've got these awesome recipes for you to go home and try that we've worked on with Martha and them. So, and then there is the fill yeah. the fork for the hunting side as well. So that is the same thing for deer, squirrel, turkey, really any major game species right now. So they're gonna be your experts there on, on who you would ask about how you get the meat ready, ready to cook it. They're the ones that know. Do we do, uh, 
Okay, Andrew, I'll let you answer that one. No, okay. I cannot see it actually where I'm on screen share. It was the, the in-person classes. So yeah. again, with COVID restrictions. Yeah, that's kind of a day. Yeah, day I know right day. now would be hard to do that, but yeah. if it wasn't here, would y'all be doing in-person classes or maybe yeah. in the future? Yeah, in the future, we're looking to get back to in-person classes, but we're still waiting for all the restrictions and everything. And then all the higher ups and everybody to tell us that, you know, we're good to go. We've got some classes on the books and you can find those on the calendar on the department's page. So some are virtual and some have parts that are virtual and some that are in person. So there'll be a good mixture so you can find something you're comfortable with. Thank or you. if you just like this webinar style, we'll be offering lots of these as well. I know Becky, the counterpart who does the build the fort program, she's got some on squirrel and deer and turkey and some of those are awesome and very informational. So if you might wanna go check those out if you're interested. Okay, we're gonna we're going to uh, to go and check the timer running, and we'll see how close we are. Okay, I think that's still a little bit slow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna add a few more calls. It seems like it's not. It's not quite going as hot as I would like it to, but you see in the pan, I don't know if Jim can tilt that down, that it is starting to get brown around the edge. So we're going to put a few more hot coals in without getting ashes on our food. I think we'll wait about five more minutes. All right, we'll do five more five more minutes of questions and then we'll get that off of there and see if it's ready for us to eat supper. So some rules that have just changed and Andrew, you may not have even heard this because we just found out with UK this week that county extension agents will be allowed to do a sampling at their classes. But our program, since we're federally funded, we still have to wait for approval from our, our federal funders to be allowed to do samples. So we can do a cooking demonstration right now, live in front of people, as long as we follow all the, all the rules um, about social distancing and wearing masks. But county extension agents are allowed now to give samples when they do those cooking demonstrations. And I'm hoping that means it'll be very soon for us that we'll be allowed to do that. Well, that's good news. Um, as far as the extension service, what kind of information and where can people find stuff on proper cooking methods for any foods or dietary guidelines stuff? If you don't know where, where your county extension office is, so in Kentucky, there is a county extension office in every single county. Um, and so if you go to, to www. And if, Andrew, if somebody put this, or Brant, somebody put it in the chat box, www.ca.uky.edu, then that will bring up the page. Of, yes, thank you. That'll bring up the page, and there's a little bar across the top, and there are several choices, and if you choose extension, it will take you to another page, and then one of the choices on that is county offices. Oh, great. He's going to show us. Okay. So on that, somewhere we've got extension. Great. And right, it's the very first thing up at the top there, county offices. And there's a, a map. And then there's also a, a list down below that. And I, I don't usually have luck clicking on the map. I have to go to the list and click on whatever county you want to. So pick out one. And so for every county, it, it almost always has a picture of the office. So it makes it easier to find. It has the, um, the address, the office hours. And if you scroll on down, somewhere down toward the bottom, there is one that says staff directory. Does that one have staff directory? There it is on, yes. 
And for most offices, that will bring up the people that are in that office. And so you may know their face already from other things, but you might not know uh, that they're a part of the extension office. So the different parts of extension are agriculture, natural resources, and horticulture. There is 4-H, and that's the one that so many people are familiar with, this 4-H program. And then uh, family and consumer sciences is the part that I work with. We even have a few fine arts extension agencies across the state, agents, just a, a few. It'd be great if we get some more of those. There are um, program assistants in most counties that help do the programming. And then there'll be staff support that's there in the office. And they are usually the person when you call or you stop in to pick up something. Uh, Cooperative Extension is funded by tax dollars and um, we're part of the land grant. I think we, I think we just had some kind of a, a birthday not too long ago. That's been around for many, many years and it is supported by federal, state and local tax dollars. Uh, counties do it a little bit differently. So um, ours is on our property tax bill. So there's a tiny little portion um, that goes from my county, Breathitt County, that then goes to support the extension uh, program in your county. And so almost everything that they do is the only charges that there are uh, is, is there's a cost. Like if you get to make something, there might be a cost. Okay. All right. Jim, Jim's telling me that, uh, that we're getting closer on the time. So would you just bring, bring the fish over to me? I think that well, we're, we're going to see, because we're, we don't want to hold you on here while, while we're waiting. If it's not done yet, we'll go ahead and finish the call, and um, we're going to cook it until it is done. And the cornbread, I could tell, was needing just a little bit longer. Okay. And to me, it looks like this is going to need a little bit longer, too, but... And I think our problem is the um, is the charcoal because the biscuits yesterday. Oh no! Look at that. Okay, I can't tell if I'm if I'm holding the camera in the right place. But see how it is flaky and it's solid white. So that means that it is that it is done. Okay. Sorry about the um, amateur camera person here. All right. So it looks like we are going to get to eat supper after all. Any final words before we wrap up? That looks really good. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Martha, for that awesome demo and some general advice. And if you guys do have any questions that Martha could answer, I can get those to her and get back to you. You all have my email from where I sent out the link for the class. And if not, just reach out to the department and they can get you to me and I can get your questions answered to the best of our abilities. But don't be afraid to reach out to your local extension office either. They're more than willing to help. Um, just a few more things to go over before we end this. Um, we are going to be having more of these type of series. The next one will be covering kayaks. So if you're interested in that, keep an eye out for that and sign up for that. Um, we, are, we are running our kayak contest again. Let me find that and share with you guys. So if you're excited to get out and go fishing now that you know how to cook it and everything, you've watched all this. If you have been fishing before, you can take somebody new who's 16 years or older, or they have not purchased a license in the last three years or their entire life. You can take them fishing, register online through the My Profile like located on the department's page, and then you can register to win this awesome kayak over here. Now this is a Jackson Bite. This is a really nice kayak. It's high quality. This is an awesome prize, it's $1,000 total, and the person you take will also get a rod and reel combo as well. So you'll be able to get them out on the water more as well. So we encourage you to take as many people as you can because every new person you take is another entry you can enter. And um, I think that's all we've got. How old do you have to be for that? Uh, well, you have to be 16 years or older to be able to purchase a license. So over 16. So you and you Certainly not me. <laughs> Next year, maybe. Next year, maybe. So, if we don't have any more questions, we're going to wrap this three. up. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't have more questions, we'll wrap this thing up. Thank you, Martha and Chase. Everybody, look forward to the next one. Thank you.